In the weather today, a Pacific weather system moves across the eastern U.S., and an atmospheric river takes aim on the northwestern portion of the country. First, we take a look at the temperature extremes around the world in the past 24 hours. Hot spot is going to be in South Africa. That's Fredendal, 112 degrees there. And there you go. That's a look at that area. Looks kind of like Southern California, maybe around Barstow. And at the other extreme, well, Dome in Antarctica reached minus 60, but in the northern hemisphere, minus 51 at Verkoyansk. Typically, the cold pole is going to be Oymyakon, which is somewhere down in this area right there, but today it is Verkoyansk. And yes, they are out there on the tundra. Across the United States, nothing quite like that, although for early December, it is kind of mild. Lots of 30s up north, 40s and 50s, and even 70s down south. That's going to be the warm sector located in the Gulf Coast region. We've got this weak Pacific front making its way across the Ohio River Valley, spreading rain and drizzle and fog across much of the northeastern U.S. Out west, snow showers in the mountains and a series of disturbances will be moving in from the Pacific, and we've got winter storm watches and warnings across much of this area here. Let's take a look at the cross sections and break things down, and you'll find out what this thing is here. In the magical world of cross sections, we take a line, say, from Quebec all the way down into the Atlantic. We do our cross sections north and south to keep things kind of simple. The left side is going to be the tropical latitudes, and the right side is going to be the northern latitudes. So this is going to be Quebec, and this is going to be around the Bahamas. And we're looking at a vertical slice through the atmosphere. So we've got the stratosphere right there. This is all the troposphere. And there's the black lines. I've had a few questions about that. And that's a very good question. The black lines are isentropes. Those are and there's these black lines, and I've had a few questions about that. Those are isentropes. They are lines of equal potential temperature. And by potential temperature, we're talking about the temperature of a parcel if it's dropped down to the bottom at 1,000 millibars. Now, what's important here is parcels will want to conserve their potential temperature. In other words, when, whenever they move around, they're going to cling to these black lines. So if we have the wind blowing from, say, south to north like that, the parcels are going to tend to ascend along this black line, and that's going to be ascent, and that's also called isentropic lift. Now looking at the surface chart, I do see that there is a southerly gradient, so very likely we do have mid-level ascent going on along the Atlantic coast. Air parcels will depart from the black line if there is a diabetic process, such as heating, evaporation, condensation, and that kind of thing. And that's probably what's happening out here where we have rain and clouds. So those assumptions about a parcel sticking to the black line, they do not hold when there is significant weather going on. And in the summertime, when we have a lot of cumulus in the sky, that's a convective weather regime, and that tends to be diabetic as well. So it's not a good assumption to use in the summertime either. Anyway, let's head west and look at the weather. Obviously, we've got that weather system right there. As we come on shore in Pennsylvania and New York, we see the isentrope steepening right there. So there's definitely some mid-level weather. We also see sloping a little bit further south across Maryland and Virginia, and that's part of that frontal boundary that's sitting right there across the Atlantic. Going further to the west, you can see this double barrel type jet stream configuration. We head into the Ohio River Basin. We see that boundary a little bit further south through that region. And then heading into the Mississippi River Valley, that's what we got right there. And then we start picking up this sloped surface a little bit better. 
kind of like that right there. And that's that cold front aloft that I drew on the map. It really stood out on that cross section, so I went ahead and put it on the map. So that seems to divide this one area here where we've got kind of a low level inversion and this other area a little bit further north where we have more of a mid-level inversion with that highly sloped frontal transition zone. All right, so we head out to the Rockies. That's where we get into some of that ridging there in between the weather systems. You can see the upper level flow starts dying out and becomes more of a subtropical jet right there, but there is still some sort of boundary aloft. Also, we start picking up some humidity, some of that smoky appearance right there, that gray, that's going to be higher relative humidity. Then going out into the Rockies, we start getting into some weather right there. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that. But down in the lower left corner, we see some bluish haze right there. That is higher specific humidity, corresponds to higher dew point. And we did see some of that back there in the Gulf of Mexico a couple minutes ago. Then heading into the west coast, that's that marine layer right there, south of Southern California. And then we get into that Pacific weather system moving on shore into Oregon and Washington. That's it right there, not a whole lot of reflection in the mid-levels just yet, but we'll probably have some stuff to look at on Monday. The 300 millibar chart this evening shows a Hudson Bay vortex centered on northwestern Quebec right there. There's another lobe located a little bit further northwest, and that's bringing weak southerly flow into central Canada. A large trough in the southwestern U.S., undercutting this ridge that's being broken down in the northern Rockies. We had a major shortwave that produced a threat of severe weather in Texas yesterday. That's going to be a little ripple moving across New York. In the Pacific, we're opening up a 150-knot polar front jet right there heading into the northwestern U.S. And that's going to produce some miserable weather in that part of the country over the next few days. We can get some sense of the upper level lift by looking at the 500 millibar heights and vorticity. This is how it looks right now. The red areas are areas of cyclonic vorticity. By tomorrow morning, we see this strong lobe moving into the northwestern U.S., affecting Seattle during the morning, and then by evening, spreading into the northern Rockies. And it's not over. Another lobe heading inland. This will affect mostly Canada for late Sunday, and then another disturbance moving inland for Tuesday night. We can also look at that with Q vectors. I'm not going to get too much into what this is, but this does use another technique to show us areas of lift. So for tomorrow morning, large area of lift moving into the Seattle area. That's indicated by the red showing Q vector convergence moving into the Rockies by evening. And there's another lobe coming into Portland for early Sunday. Another lobe moving across Canada, like I mentioned, for Sunday night. And then for late Monday into Tuesday, there's some more energy heading into the Pacific Northwest. Here's how things look on the 1,000 through 700 millibar thickness chart with sea level pressure. We can easily find that frontal boundary. In fact, there's a little wave on the Texas coast and then we pick up the warm front somewhere out there in Alabama and Georgia. You can see the thickness gradient up to the north and not so much down to the south. And that thickness gradient does carry around the backside into Texas. We don't see as much of that out to the west, and that's definitely pointing to this being more of a mid-level weather system in the northwestern U.S. So let's just put it together and watch things progress. In the lower Mississippi River Valley, we can see not much wind and very little pressure gradient. So there's not a whole lot of significant weather with that frontal low in Illinois. In the northwestern U.S., we see that wind velocity picking up out of the southwest strong onshore component with snow in some of the higher elevations. Then going into tomorrow morning, Bands of rain and snow moving into Washington and Oregon. 
We do have winter storm warnings throughout much of the northwestern U.S. the entire weekend. Looking for very heavy snow in the Cascades. Above 2,500 feet, there could be 6 to 12 inches of snow with locally 2 to 4 feet. The Blue Mountains in northeastern Oregon could see 10 to 20 inches of snow with higher amounts above 5,000. And the Bitter Roots above 4,000 feet could see up to a foot of snow. And the Wasatch Range near Salt Lake City, they are looking for 20 to 30 inches of snow with wind gusts up to 50 miles an hour. So let's see it unfold. There's that band moving across Idaho during the day Saturday and into the Salt Lake City and Yellowstone area around evening on Saturday. And they do have a winter storm watch in northwestern Wyoming. Yellowstone expecting 12 to 20 inches of snow. We see that impulse moving into the front range around Sunday morning and a lot of residual instability out to the west with another band of rain coming onto the coast. And that's how things look for midday Sunday and then during the evening. So a lot of this snow will be continuing across the mountains into much of the weekend. And then going into Monday, this is when the big kahuna moves inland. This band of rain is going to be a little bit warmer, so not quite as much snow with that. But behind it, it will bring a long fetch from the Pacific, which means very rough seas along the coast up to 15 to 20 feet in some areas. Anyway, once we're done with that system, it moves into the northern plains. We do get kind of a quiet period, southerly flow through the central U.S. later in the week. And then as we go into next weekend, there's indications we'll see anticyclogenesis in western Canada or the northwestern U.S. You can see we're already building 1040 up there in British Columbia. This is getting kind of far out, but it does even bring it up to 1050 over Yellowstone. So depending on how this plays out, there could be a return to cold weather going into middle of December. And that's going to be the latest frame I have. Coastal low indicated off of Texas, but 240 hours is pretty iffy as far as forecast accuracy. And the 500 millibar chart is showing ridging across that area, indicating a rather shallow cold air outbreak. And with this cutoff low down in the southwestern U.S., that indicates there are a lot of questions about the accuracy of this model leading up to this point. So we definitely want to just kind of put this aside and look at it next week. Now, those of you who have been with us know that I hardly ever plug my books and software, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now. Weather Map Handbook, this is a recent book that I just put out. Pick up a copy at weathergraphics.com and help support this program at the same time. And Weather Writer Handbook is another good one. And we do have other book titles that you might be interested in. So check it out, weathergraphics.com. We would like to see that support. And that will conclude this edition of Forecast Lab. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday for the Patreon supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.